PhD on early Iron Age elite burials in the Low Countries, um, and today I want to share some of the results with you. Uh, given the theme of the session, focusing specifically on the Central European influences that I'm seeing in the burial ritual. Now, the graves I studied are primarily known as the Hausstall Sea chieftains' graves. A uh, famous example here, of course, the Ost burial that uh, Richard already gave us a sneak peek of. They date predominantly <coughs> to the 8th and 7th century BC. They are cremation graves, and in them we find uh, weaponry, bronze vessels, uh, horse gear, and wagons in various configurations. Now, in terms of my data set, I had 33 sites, uh, which covered about 70 probable barrows and flat graves, as well as a dozen stray finds of swords or bronze vessels that we believe are burials. Um, in terms of where we find them, they're almost all located in or by the urn fields that Ariane was talking about uh, before the break. Um, we often find them in high points of the landscape, at least by Dutch standards. Um, sometimes we have a single elite burial, sometimes there are more in one location, sometimes the elite burial reflects a, a short period of use, and sometimes an area was used for a longer period of time. Now why am I saying Central European connection? It's because of the grave goods. Uh, the swords, the bronze vessels, the horse gear, and the wagon components are pretty much all grave goods imported from the Hallstatt culture of Central Europe, so the so-called Hallstatt set. Um, in the Hallstatt culture, uh, so in southern Germany and Upper Austria, they are primarily found in inhumation burials. Um, the grave goods are deposited intact. Here, Hochdorf, which is slightly later than the graves I'm talking about, but still quite a nice comparison. And in the Hallstatt culture, it is uh, frequently argued that they reflect the rise of a new cosmology or religion. Um, and if we look at where we're finding these objects, there's a very striking distribution. You've got a nice all concentrated in the Hallstatt culture, then nothing, and then we have them, which is uh, given that it's 800 uh, BC, it's quite striking. So we know that at least the objects and likely also people were coming from up there to us, and it also looks like they may have been going back. Um, now, I focus specifically on the burial data from the Low Countries for my project, which is very difficult data to work with. Uh, they're almost all really old finds, sometimes up to several hundred years ago, often chance finds, uh, or found by a Belgian baron who would go out and open up 20 barrows in an afternoon. So the context information tends to be very limited. So it's very difficult data to work with. So what I did is I ended up uh, trying to come up with a way of visualizing both what was found in the graves and studying how those objects ended up in that grave, how they were treated. Um, and I made all these charts, and just an example, this, for example, shows you that the sword found in Bosse Vavre was burnt and broken prior to deposition, and this tells you that a knife in Osforstochov was bent and then wrapped in textile. And when I did this for all the graves in my data set, um, and compared them with the chronological <coughs> development, uh, we could track quite nicely how this elite burial practice developed. And actually, it develops uh, in the late Bronze Age. We see the rise of this practice of identifying the dead as elite through the internment of bronze swords. And this is very much that period where we're transitioning from deposition practices to placement in graves. I've got a baker's dozen of these, and what struck me when I looked at how they were buried is that the burial practice is very much in line with the Urnfield burial practice that Ariel is studying, uh, except that they're sometimes marked by a large barrow. I find the swords are burnt, bent, broken, and sometimes partially deposited in what we think are partial plateau depositions. And what's so important is that these graves are at least primarily Atlantic creations. So this practice of elite burial actually, at least in material sense, seems to predate contact with Central Europe, at least as far as we can see in terms of surviving grave goods. And then in the 8th century, we start to get this influx of iron sword graves, which are very similar, but then also with imported Mindelheim swords from the Hallstatt culture. We've got a dozen of these, and um, again, the swords are deposited both bent and broken, but we also have a few cases where the sword is placed in what we think is a grave straight, and there's a striking correlation that the grave, or what I think are graves, or what seem to be graves where the sword is straight, the cremation remains were never found. So the question is, are, what are we seeing here? Is this just lack of context information, or are we also seeing something different? But again, burial practice very much in line with the Urnfield graves. And the same is true for the bronze vessel burials. Um, pretty much indistinguishable from 
what we call Argyll's graves, except that the pot is made of bronze. And again, one or two of these pots were not found with surviving cremation remains, but again, due to fine context, we don't know if that's just differential survival or again, something intentional. And the same again with personal appearance, which Arion also talks about. We find ornaments and toiletries uh, items in these graves, which uh, also, in for the most case, are relatively unremarkable, with some exceptions, like this burial from uh, Udis Labruk, where someone was buried with quite an exceptional set of ornaments. So, in terms of how people were buried, it seems that if they were interred with only a sword, only a bronze vessel, or only items related to personal appearance, be they ornaments, be they toiletry kits. In terms of the burial practice, they are not all that exceptional. It's very much, for lack of a better word, the normal way of burying. So these objects by themselves do not appear to have triggered particularly special treatment in death. But I had some graves where I was seeing something different. Uh, not only did they have more grave goods, sometimes this Holstelt set of a sword a bronze bucket and a wagon, but I was also seeing something different in the choices made and the actions taken during the burial rituals themselves. It's an exaggerated burial practice with dismantling, manipulation, fragmentation, and pospototo depositions very much emphasized, exaggerated. And it is also in these graves that I saw the use of textile to wrap grave goods. They also tend to be found in larger barrows. Now, one example, for example, is the uh, Chieftain's Burial of Vos, which we reconstructed here, uh, painting by Ralph Timmermans, based on the data that I reconstructed. And we see it was very much a destructive burial. Objects were taken apart. The bronzes were taken off a yoke and put in the bucket. The sword with the fantastic gold inlay was r curled round and wrapped in textile. The butchering knife was wrapped in textile and placed with the butchering axe, and all of this was carefully, deliberately placed in this bronze bucket. And the bucket then, then, along with, by the way, the cremated remains of the chieftain himself, were buried in a Middle Bronze Age barrow and then covered with one of the largest barrows in this part of Europe, uh, 53 meters in diameter. So a very deliberate but destructive burial practice. Now, if we look at these graves where I'm seeing this exaggerated burial uh, practice, the only thing that links them is that they all have wagon components or wagon-related horse gear. Um, now, this is not always easy to recognize because this burial practice was so destructive. For example, these tiny broad studs, they're about this big, uh, only because this was an exceptionally well-excavated um, bur burial mound, Mount Seven of Olseve Berge, were we able to reconstruct that they are actually the remains of a burnt yoke. Now, if you have a yoke, means you have the horses, if you have horses in the yoke, you've got a wagon, you really have to sort of make this mental leap of going from tiny pieces of bronze to these elaborate ceremonial wagons. So it seems that there's something funny going on with this horse gear and these wagon components. On the one hand, they're extensively used, like this beat, uh, this beat, bit from Wichen, which is pretty much almost worn through, it's about to break. On the other hand, we've got these bits from Merlo, which are in the Centre Cermique here in Maastricht, that are so large, though typologically perfect Hallstatt bits, they're so large that even today there is not a horse big enough to wear them. They, they cannot be used. So this seems to fit with what we're seeing in Central Europe in that these wagons were not about getting from A to B. They were ceremonial and cosmologically charged uh, vehicles that we also see reflected in the later sigil art where they feature in processions. So what I believe is that in the Low Countries these ceremonial wagons were really radically new and exotic and it seems that that has marked out these particular individuals also in death. But even beyond that, uh, in some cases we can see that the choice of grave goods actually reflects household culture burial customs. So in these four riches burials, Gorsan and Chantum was three, Os, Reine, and Wiche itself, these people were buried with axes. Between Arjan and my data set, these are the only four early Iron Age burials in the Netherlands and Belgium where an axe was placed in the burial, as far as we know. If you know of one, please don't tell me, actually. Um, <laughs> but importantly, the axes are locally made, or at least regional products. They are definitely not imports from the household culture which means that the choice to add them to these grave sets was made here. And from the Dutch or Belgian perspective, that makes no sense. You just didn't put an axe in a grave. 
in the Hallstatt culture, you did. They were ritual butchering axes. So it seemed that there really was a local understanding of the Hallstatt culture way of burying. So in conclusion, it would seem that actually the majority of what we consider exceptional elite burials are actually the result of a relatively normal, for lack of a better word, early Iron Age of burying. They share a local practice, but, and it's a big but, wagons made the def dead different. And it, at the same time, we're seeing that these exotic influences are embedded and recontextualized through the no local norm. So even the most exotic burials in terms of grave goods still recontextualize through this local destructive burial practice. Oh, thank you very much.